So welcome to my channel. My name is Frederick Dunn and I keep honeybees right here on my property in the northeastern United States in the state of Pennsylvania. This is a solitary native pollinator. Another bee that goes by the name of Apis melisodes. These are specialists on sunflowers. But what we're going to show you here are the bees that I keep, how I keep them, and an issue I have with one specific hive design. We're going to show you some interesting honeybee biology. Sunflowers are just blooming and this is in the month of July, late July actually. But the bees that I keep and manage are non-native and these are the honeybees, commonly known as Apis mellifera. We have a lot of different hive designs because part of what I do is evaluate honeybee equipment and see how the bees manage in this environment, which gets, by the way, extended cold periods. Here's another hive. The farther apart they are, the better off they are because the bees don't drift to one another and move into each other's colonies and share their problems as well as their benefits. One hive design in particular, though, gives me a lot of information about honeybees and allows me to see their behavior and photograph, video, and share about honeybee biology. And that's this building right here that has an observation hive in it. This little white entrance with an inch and a half diameter tube carries the bees inside to a pretty confined space. And once you get inside here, you are going to hear not just the general humming of the bees themselves, but there are piping queens. There's one right there. We can't see them, they're in their cells. And when bees are making preparations to give birth to another colony, you start to hear those queens piping. That means they're in cap cells and they're going to hatch soon. That tells me a couple of things about this colony in this observation hive. It tells me that the population in this hive is healthy and strong and that the environment is about to yield plenty of resources. You will hear lots of different queens piping different tones, different notes and frequencies. But look how calm these bees are. They're in no hurry to depart yet, which means the resident queen is still there. But before the new queens hatch out, the resident queen is going to have to leave and she's going to take most of these workers with her. In this video, we're going to show that entire process. So it's going to be interesting. If you're in a hurry, this is probably not the video to be watching. I'm not known for racing you through information about honeybees. We're looking at brood frames here. See that cinnamon capping on those hexagonal cells? Those are bees that are waiting to hatch out. So the latest stage is the pupa phase. Now look here in the lower left. We've got a little bee trembling around there that looks like it's trying to do a waggle dance but isn't very good at it. Truth is, that's a foraging bee that's trembling to get other bees to take the nectar away. Look at the lower right here. We see a bee facing down with its tongue extended and it's taking nectar from a forager who's showing us her underside because she's stuck on this plexiglass. This lets us watch what they do. So when foragers come into the hive, the first areas that they encounter would be the brood areas. And then the nurse bees and nectar storage bees will take their cargo from them and distribute it. In the top of this colony, you see capped honey. And then we go right down into brood cells. But you'll notice the bulk of these cells are now uncapped. And hearing those piping queens lets us know that they're soon going to depart. The population is huge in this colony considering its constriction. It has eight deep cells in it, deep frames, 
and that's the equivalent of a single deep eight frame Langstroth box. That's a queen piping and you're going to hear more of that. Let's listen. Now this observation hive is contained in a building that is not heated. So there are two queens piping at the same time. Honeybees, when they make replacement queen cells, generally don't do just one or two. They might do three, four, or even six queen cells. Notice that some of this brace comb that's attached to the glass is full of nectar right there. So we're in the honey store area, which is at the very top of the hive. And you can see the golden honey there in those cells, which is another advantage of having a glass observation window because sometimes they build their cells right on it and we can see what goes on inside them. So bees store honey and nectar and pollen. The pollen, of course, is lower down and adjacent to those brood frames, so the nurse bees have ready access to them. Now as the camera pans down lower through these frames, you'll actually hear the queens piping louder. That was a queen piping. And that was a rival queen. Now in order to avoid conflict between the existing queen and those that are about to hatch, a swarm has to emit first, before they hatch. When you hear that, it's too late to split the colony. You can't just expand a hive. And part of the problem with having an observation hive is that we can't add boxes and we can't give them any extra room. So now we know what piping queens sound like. The first of those piping queens to hatch out will continue that piping sound and she will listen and feel for the piping of other queens not yet emerged. She'll travel right over there and sting them through their queen cells.
if more than one queen emerges at the same time, they will actually fight it out, and both of them would be in jeopardy of being profoundly injured and possibly not being able to carry on the duties in the beehive. Most often there's only one queen in a colony, although from time to time you see two. These are unemployed foraging bees at the top, and here's what's going on outside. This is normal hive activity at the landing board. They have a single entrance, and they're ventilating through that. And it sounds like someone left the dryer on. Look at the difference. Now there's a call to action inside the observation hive. Every honeybee is mobilized. Not all of them will leave, but most of them will. Generally 50 to 70% of this observation hive's population is about to depart with the existing queen before those piping queens have a chance to hatch out. This, of course, would be happening inside your beehive in total darkness, and the beekeeper would not see this activity. What you would see is what's going on at the entrance, at the landing board. And we're going to show you that too. But I want you to see how excited and animated every single worker bee inside the hive becomes just before the departure of the existing queen. Now the single entrance in this observation hive is at the bottom. This is what's going on outside. If you watch carefully, you're gonna actually see the queen departing. You can really see in slow motion how chaotic this behavior is, with bees entering in vast numbers and departing in vast numbers, and the rest of them hovering around waiting for the queen to depart. Those that are rushing back through the entrance and then leaving again are anxiously awaiting the queen to depart, and they'll follow her pheromone. When they stop going back in in numbers like that, you'll know the queen has left. Keep a sharp eye out. She's right there on the landing board, leaving now. There she is again. Lower left, and she's gone. Oh! So you just saw the queen at 15.07, 1500. 15 minutes, zero seconds. Look at that again if you missed it. 
The queen has departed, and you'll notice that fewer of the bees were going back in the hole. Now we have to find out where they've flown to. They're going to reassemble in a bivouac location, and wouldn't you know it, in this blue spruce tree. About 14 feet off the ground. They'll spend some time reassembling on this branch and they'll keep the queen safe and secure in the center. The outside temperatures today are about 86 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is considered a swarm cluster. No reason to rush up there and grab them, but we are going to hive this swarm because I want to show you the entire process. This is considered honeybee superorganism reproduction when one colony produces another colony of bees. So remember these are the old bees. These are the foragers. You'll see some with pollen packs on their legs. They've also filled up on honey before they left. The old queen is with them. And as we already know, there are multiple replacement queens in their cells ready to hatch out. Sometimes you'll see drones as well traveling with the swarm. The drones of course are their own genetic material that carry on their traits. There are thousands of bees here. If you had to weigh them we're talking about maybe three pounds worth of bees, three to four pounds. So it's not a huge swarm, but remember, they came out of a very small space, just an eight deep frame observation hive. Now, because I wanna show you every step of this, I'm gonna to have to find a ladder and make my way up here and show you how I collect and hive a swarm of honeybees. Now while they're gathering on that tree branch, I'm going to go ahead and set up the hive that we're going to put them in. We're going to start out with a solid bottom board. And we're going to use an entrance reducer because the swarm needs to be protected. They need a small space that they can defend. Next thing we're going to add is what's called a slatted rack. This is a 10 frame slatted rack. That gives them a little more space, makes hiving a swarm much easier. And of course, we're putting in a single brood box preloaded with 10 frames. An old inner cover that's got propolis on it, some burr comb, and will definitely smell as if bees have occupied the space before and we want them to be comfortable and a polystyrene insulated lid also known as a telescoping lid so we're going to put that on there leave space we have two hives side by side different colors different configurations now we're back to the tree let's see how to get up there and get those bees this is my horizontal long Langstroth hive and the entrance is facing south. So at first I think, you know, I have this 10 foot step ladder. I'll put that up there, but then I'm thinking I'm right in front of the entrance to my long Langstroth hive. Maybe this isn't the best angle. And this is a 10 foot step ladder. Yeah, I'm gonna change that position. I figure by the way, if I climb up this ladder, cause I'm working alone, if I fall over, some people might actually like seeing me topple off a ladder. But I wanna show you the whole process. I think I'm gonna get close enough with that 10 foot ladder and the bees are about four feet beyond that. Yes, I put on my bee jacket. Been stung in the face, in the hands, even though 
A swarm of bees that's bivouacked on a branch is in its least defensive state. They're generally very passive, but guess what we're going to do? We're going to shake them off that branch right into this butterfly net, which is kind of pillowcase material. And if you'll notice, we stitched off a segment at the bottom of it. Gives me a section of the fabric to grab without pinching any bees once they get in it. You can also buy bass fishing nets and things like that. Pull the net material off and replace it with a nice cloth like this. Gets you in among the branches. You don't have to cut the branches off. And I soak the bees with one to one sugar syrup and a little honeybee healthy. And that adds weight to them. Keeps them damp. Keeps them in place. And then when I give the branch a shake, they'll fall into this net easier. Let's see how it goes. Lots of shaking. Into the bag they go. And there you have a swarm of bees. I gave a quick look back there to make sure I got the main clump. Because remember, the queen's in the middle somewhere, or so we hope. There they are, honeybees in a bag. Now we're just gonna hand carry this over to the new hive we've set up, which is only about 100 feet away. Now we have three pre-drawn out plastic frames and the rest of the frames here have an uh, acorn heavy wax foundation in them and the bees will have to draw those out but the three already drawn out frames are the ones the bees can use now now to keep them all from flying off right there we're going to soak them down a little bit and I also spray some down inside the hive so that the bees will be encouraged to get down there and go after some of this sugar syrup Now we know what the queen looks like, big fat queen. I'm actually surprised that she was in flying shape. The bees tend to chase the queen around for a while. They reduce her feed consumption and they get her ready to fly so that when they swarm, they can travel a decent distance. They almost never depart their original cavity and go directly to their next home. They almost always bivouac on a tree branch fence post, somebody's house, while the scouts go out and search for a new home. So what we've done is interrupted that. We're going to slide this inner cover on here carefully. Plow some bees in there. Take your time. There's no rush here. And uh, we can just make sure that the queen's inside. That's all we care about. Because the rest of these bees are going to spread her pheromone into the air. And those bees that are flying around that came with the swarm are going to eventually find their way here. Get to the end here, that's the guillotine point. You want to move slowly and not squash any bees. It's kind of a goal. And there we have it, no smush bees. You smash a bee, you'll see an immediate response from those adjacent to the smashed bee. So your goal is always just take your time slide things around. Now we'll see that opening. That oval opening is really designed for a bee escape. Most people use it for a feeding hole. And you could put your rapid round or some other feeder over that. But uh, the oval shape is from a plastic bee escape that used to be widely used to get bees out of uh, boxes of honey supers. Gonna watch them for a while and see their behavior and just make sure that we do have the queen. And we watch those bees on the top of the cover and see if they actually start going down in that hole. And if they do, she must be in there. Let's get you a closer look here.
Now all the abdomen twirling and twisting that's going on with these bees, that's because they've been sprayed with sugar syrup. Now we do see some bees going across the surface and walking in that opening and some that are even airborne are landing and going down in there. So I'm pretty confident that the queen is in there and we can go ahead and put that polystyrene cover on which will provide insulation from summer heat as well as winter cold. And again the reason I like to use an old inner cover or old material even when I'm hiving a swarm is that they feel that it is a place where bees have lived before and that helps keep them there. Also, bees don't like your breath. So if you want to just blow them off the edge there so you don't smash any bees while you put your cover on, that works also. No crunchy sounds. No smash bees. Now we look at the front of the hives here, which face south. And I'm giving the adjacent hive spray with the same sugar syrup and essential oil formula there. That will give them something to do so they don't pay attention to this brand new colony that just moved in next door. And for starters, we're using a very small entrance reducer here, a little over an inch. This will give the newly installed swarm of bees an easy to defend entrance to the hive. Now what they're doing inside is walking around the space. There are scouts and workers in there that are actually still in the approval process. They have to accept it. If they don't, they could abscond. All of your bees could leave if for some reason they don't find this cavity suitable. So we'll watch them for a while and make sure that they're spreading the queen's pheromone and that they start to set up a guard system. So once they've decided to stay where they are, we'll see more guards on the landing board and they'll begin to defend the space and foragers will start their orientation flights. They'll do little figure eight zigzags in front of this hive, fly little corkscrew circles up into the air and come back and they will visually register what the hive looks like and then the landscape. Features in the landscape will help them find this new hive. Now if we took the queen out and removed her altogether, what would happen with all these bees? Would they stay without a queen? No, they would eventually give up and return to the same observation hive they left from, but our problem would be the same. It was overpopulated. So now we have lots of bees at this lower entrance. And they are spreading the queen's pheromone. You see that posture with the abdomen held high there and the Nazanoff gland exposed. Spreading the queen's pheromone and announcing to the others that this is where they've decided to stay. It's also a good sign that your queen is resident. If you look at that top center worker there, you can see the Nazanoff gland clearly exposed there, spreading her pheromone. Slowed it down just so you can get a better look at that. So the bees that are swirling around and trying to find out where that queen went, because remember, not all of them went in the bag, they will eventually locate this group. Now, if others land on the tree, and if I didn't go back and collect that follow-on cluster there, they would also simply return to the original observation hive that they emitted from. And it gave them a little squirt of uh, sugar syrup there on the landing board also, just in case that pheromone that's in there with the essential oils is something else they're targeting. Now I went back and scooped another handful of bees off that branch. And then we just tilt that here up against the landing board and you'll see them marching up and going in the opening. Further evidence that the queen must be inside the hive because even the bees that we collected from the branch, if it had been a tiny branch, I would have just clipped it off and laid that branch right on top of this hive or on the landing board off to the side 
because her pheromone is associated with that branch. And I also noticed that the adjacent hive has a high population of bees, so we expanded it. I added another medium super, there's an inner cover, and then a feeder shim on top of that. That's also a young swarm of bees that's only been in there for about 22 days. And again, after they're established, I'll replace the solid entrance reducer with a screened entrance reducer. But for now, we're keeping it solid because we found that uh, the more secure they feel, the more they apt, more apt they are to stay. If that entrance were wide open and they felt they couldn't defend it, they also may reject the space. So here we are, we put a rapid round feeder that holds half a gallon right on top because we have heavy weather coming. I want this newly installed swarm of bees to take up residence and of course start drawing comb. And just maybe that queen will start laying with, within the next three or four days. We do have guards on the landing board, good sign. Plus they're doing housekeeping. All those little bits and pieces there are evidence that the bees inside are mm -hmm. starting to shape it to meet their needs. And the guards are running over and checking out my camera and my lens. So that's a good sign too. I think we've hived a swarm. I think we're good to go there. And this is the configuration. The colors are different because we have two hives right next to each other. That bird box right there serves as a landmark for them to navigate by. And then we come back inside and see what's left in the observation hive. We still have plenty of honey stores up top there, but we'll also notice most of the brood cappings are gone. So this hive is going to see a steady decline in numbers until the new queens hatch. And we start to see new bees in about 30 days. I hope you enjoy this video and maybe you'll consider subscribing. There'll be more about backyard honey beekeeping in future videos. Thanks for watching today and don't forget we have solitary bees out there too that are pollinators just, just like this little Melissa D's bee that is a specialist for sunflowers. Beekeepers should do everything they can to support all pollinators at every opportunity. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.